In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you today. Today we hear one of the great I am statements from the God. Well, first of all, just first of all, just humor me. Just curious. How many people watched the Friday finale video that came out in your email on Friday? Come put those hands up high. Who didn't watch it? Put those hands up higher. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm not trying to call you out. So if you watched that video, you would have noticed that I have a lot of excitement about this passage. I love this, the great I am statements in the gospel. John, I actually just love the gospel of John. It's my favorite of the four gospels. Light and dark, life and death. Beautiful imagery of a God who the early church just grabs onto and redefines for us to understand. And this is one of those great passages where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And that probably in our minds hearkens us back to what we do every Sunday. Probably brings us right here to this table, right here to the Eucharistic feast, where in our Eucharistic prayer we'll hear those great words that come from the Apostle Paul, or the disciple Paul, I should say. This is the bread, this is the wine, this is my body, this is my blood. But there's so much more to this whole statement that I am the bread of life. You see, for the longest time, the Hebrew people somewhat wandered from who God was or is. They had an image of God as a God who was, at different times they lost their way, I should say, and that redefined their image of God as someone who wasn't there caring for them, who didn't necessarily love them. But in actuality, from the very beginning, God loved. From Genesis, God loved. And if we believe in the Trinity and we believe Jesus, then Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus is God. So if you think about Deuteronomy, there's this great passage in Deuteronomy where God looks at God's people and says, I put before you two paths, the path of life and the path of death. Choose life. God doesn't say, hey, here's two paths. Life is really gonna be exciting. Hope you'll pick this one, a lot of fun. You and I are gonna get along really well. Here's this other one, it's kind of equal, it's a little darker, might not like it, it's gonna be a little bumpy, a little hurt a little bit, but you know, hey, here's two opportunities for you. Not what God does. And consistently throughout the scriptures, God comes to God's people, constantly calling them to life. To life, the prophets prophesy to this reality. And God created us to love him. But in that creation, God gave us choice. Gave us choice to choose whether we want to choose life or we want to choose death. Do we want to live for God or not live for God? But no matter which way we choose, God stayed very much in our midst. The overwhelming loving goodness of God stays with us no matter where we are. Because if we're honest, at different moments in our life, as we heard Paul say to the church in Ephesus, we go to bed angry. We succumb to the passions. We're coveting things. You know, I've, I've listened, my wife and I are living into this reality right now. Every time we walk into our master bathroom, we're like, gosh, I want my master bathroom to look like theirs. Well, that's coveting. And if you really think about it, we covet a lot. We covet when we see a cool car go down the road. When we see a big house we like. We see a cool trip we hear about, although that might be weird right now during COVID. We're not hearing about all these cool trips. Pre-COVID, we covet a lot. And that's when we choose the path of death. So now fast forward to today, to the Gospel of John. Here Jesus is standing amongst his disciples and the religious elite of his day, and he drops the mic or the hammer, or both. And he says, I am the bread of life. Now, anybody who knows anything about bread, <clears throat> I used to love to make bread pre-kids when I had time to really do it. It's a lot of work to make bread. You know, you gotta go to the store, you gotta buy the ingredients, you gotta put it together, you gotta be patient, you gotta sit there and knead it the right way. 
And I used to love to make creative breads, garlic breads, rosemary, thyme, sourdoughs, you know, all sorts of things. Now I just lean on the Clemens. They take good care of me. <laughs> That's what happens when you have kids. You just, you need people like the Clemens to help you do this. But you make bread, a lot of ingredients go into the bread. And the first thing Jesus does by saying, I'm the bread of life, is he takes God and humanity and he merges it together. He merges it together, the reality that God is fully here, that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. I am the bread of life. I'm different than that bread that came down to your ancestors in the wilderness. I am life. I am the fullness of life. I am the epitome of all things life. I am God with you. So very early on, Jesus redefines for God's people right in this moment and reminds them that all along, God has been about life, not death, good, not evil, and I am life. Now, of course, understandably, the religious elite are so confused by this. You know, they're sitting there looking at Jesus going, aren't you Joseph's son? Aren't you from that little backwater town over there? Don't even remember the name of it, like carpenter, you mess with wood. Now you're telling me you came from heaven, like what's this all about? A little weird. But that's exactly what Jesus does all the time. He constantly redefines the reality of God's presence amidst God's people. And he calls them back to life. Now, as I said before, one of the great reminders in this passage is this Eucharistic feast that we take. I often refer to it as food for the journey. That we gather around this table, what we do on Sunday is not just listen to hymns we like, not say the prayers that we wanna hear. We come together to partake of this feast, to partake of the body and blood of Christ. It's not just a remembrance. It's not just a, hey, Jesus did this in some upper room many, many years ago. We're gonna kind of remember it. No, we believe that this is God that when I hand you that wafer, you are receiving God into your body, into your soul. And that I'd like to believe that in each one of us, when we partake of that bread and that wine, that something inside us sparks, something comes to life, that maybe we remember just if only for a moment, that when God created each one of us, God said, you are very good. Maybe for a moment, we remember that we were made in the image and likeness of God. We were made in the image of likeness of the greatest lover of all time. And that just maybe for a moment, when we gather around this table and we go back to our seats and in our daily prayers and in our time, we remember that we have a responsibility to the world to share this reality, to share this good news. Paul says to the church in Ephesus, we can't slander, we can't be angry, we can't revile one another. That's not what people who are choosing life do. That to partake of this Eucharistic feast is only a, a stop, a way station, a break, a, a respite, an oasis in our week where we receive nourishment and are reminded of the great responsibility that we all share to go out and be kingdom builders, to go out and reconnect with God, to remember the importance of our daily prayers, of our practices, of our choices, to remember that we are gonna always be faced with temptation. The early church is fraught with examples of people faced with the passion. This Eucharistic feast calls us to watchfulness, which is how we handle the passion. It's how we live into the bread of life. It's how we constantly choose life and not death. When we're watchful, we listen to those thoughts that pop in our mind. And I bet I am willing to bet, unless I'm a unique creature, that in this day and time, there are probably lots of thoughts that pop in our head. And I'm willing to bet there's lots of thoughts of judgment that pop in our heads today, in this moment. 
and there may be others. If we're watchful, we connect with those thoughts. And we lump them in maybe into three places. Temptation, the evil inclination, as they say, that's within us to choose the passion. So coveting another master bathroom, that's probably not from God. That goes in that box. Neutral, that's a thought that doesn't really have a whole lot to do with glorifying God and being a kingdom builder, but it doesn't really have anything to do with hurting God or, or choosing the path of death. It's just kind of one of those neutral things. I need a glass of water, I'm thirsty. And then of the Holy Spirit. And this box and these thoughts are really come to their fullness when we intentionally choose a path with God. When we really believe Jesus is the bread of life and we take time out of our day, not just here and there, but time out of our day to reconnect with God. And those thoughts are powerful. Those are the ones that move you to care for your brother and sister. Those are the ones who might open you up to reconciliation with somebody who you might be at odds with. Those are the ones that move you outside of yourself. And you realize that maybe in this world, I don't have all the answers. And maybe these people I think are crazy, they might have some answers too. These are the thoughts that come from God. These are the thoughts that we watch for. These are what the early church call genesis of the spirit, movers of the spirit, motivators. Because in those moments, and these thoughts come into our mind all the time, all the time. We don't always listen to them. We don't always pay attention. We aren't always watchful. But when we are, amazing things happen. So you see, my brothers and sisters, we hear this passage today about I am the bread of life. It's not just about coming around this table and taking a wafer and some wine. It's about truly re-characterizing and redefining our life to be in union with the penultimate giver of life, which is God. It is about us truly embracing God and holding one another and truly being those kingdom builders. And it starts here around this table. That's why I say every Sunday, come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here your whole life and you who have been here five minutes, you who have tried and you who have failed. Because it's not me. It's not me who invites you. It's not humanity that invites you. It's not those who claim to be righteous that invites you. It's we sinners that come with you at Christ's invitation to this table because it's God's will that you shall meet God here every Sunday, here around this table. Amen. Amen.